Hello, hello everyone. How are we doing here today? How's everyone feeling on this Tuesday afternoon? Hope you're doing very well. My name is Ross. I'm the uh, director of content at LSAT Max here. I'll be the host of this webinar that we have coming to you from LSAT Max. And what are we going to talk about today? Well, hopefully as your screen will now display, we're talking about conditional statements later today. Conditional statements on the LSAT, all you need to know about sufficiency and necessity to get started with your LSAT studies. Um, hopefully, uh, if you've already been studying conditional statements to a certain extent, you can notice kind of what we're doing with this title, with that, with that subtitle. Uh, if not, hopefully by the end of this of this session, we'll get we'll get a good understanding of what what's going on with that title. But we'll get to it now we'll uh, all start learning about conditional statements. Now, before we do, I just wanna get a quick confirmation that everyone can hear me well, coming to you loud and clear, and that you can actually see the screen that I'm displaying right now. So in the chat section, if you could just give me a quick yes, if you can see the screen and you can hear what I'm saying right now, great, great. Thank you all, thank you all. Sounds like we're all, uh, we're, we're all hearing each other, which is great. Um, so quick question from Adina. Adina asks, how will, will we be here today? We will be here for about an hour. This is gonna be a fast paced webinar. I'm gonna go through a lot of material pretty quickly because I think you can handle it. And I think really this is all you need to know about conditional statements to get started. So I'm gonna to try to get through the material I've planned today in about an hour, but we will be spending time at the end of this after that hour, answering any questions that you have. And if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section of this webinar. We'll be talking to each other through the chat section. That's where I'll we'll hear from you as I ask you questions as we go through this presentation. But if, you've, if you have any questions you would like addressed at the end of today's session, just go ahead and put it in the Q&A section and I will address them once we get through everything. All right, let's get started. Now, even though I said we'll be going through these things quickly, these always go a little bit better if we talk to each other. And the place where I would like to hear from you is the chat section of this. So we'll do a quick little icebreaker warm up in that chat section so we all get used to using it, though we're already getting used to it. So make sure it says everyone in the chat section, that you're responding to everyone so we can all see each other's answers. And write out just quickly where you're from, where you went to college and what you studied there. And finally, your answer to the question, if you're from my hometown, then you, and then answer that, whatever is true of your hometown. You know, in this last, year and a half or so. I haven't gotten to travel as much as, as I would like to. I haven't gotten to go to new places. So this is my kind of replacement for that. Learning about places from you. What do you, what's true, what's a stereotype, what's a commonality for people from where you're from? I'd love to, love to learn that, have this, uh, have this experience from y'all. So got a lot of answers already. I'll, I'll answer mine. Uh, my name is Ross. I'm from San Diego originally, though I live in Los Angeles and I've lived here for a long time now. Because I went to college in UCLA and eventually law school at USC, I kind of stuck around in the LA area. In college, I studied English and political science as like so many people uh, do before going to law school. I know those are very cliched majors to have before that, but it's what I studied. And if you're from my hometown of San Diego, then you have very strong opinions on burritos. Uh, ask a San Diegan about burritos and what should and should not go into burrito, and you will hear a soliloquy from them about, uh, about that. So, uh, okay, we got, wow, uh, Victoria from England, uh, tally ho. Uh, we got Tanya from New York, uh, Adina from Orange County. Uh, shouts to my fellow Southern Californians. Lansing, Michigan, represented Laredo, Texas, Georgia, New York. Uh, C says, if you're from their hometown, you should try Grater's ice cream. Where is that? Uh, very nice to hear you be welcoming refugees in Highland Park, New Jersey, Susan. Uh, Alexandra, uh, if you're from Orlando, then you love Disney. Makes sense. Uh, let's see. Uh, Janelle. If you're from my hometown, you're probably okay. Um, let's uh, let's keep uh, political opinions to there uh, to uh, a minimum, even though we are kind of talking about 
common beliefs of regions. Um, let's see. Okay, if you're from Anelli, says you're from my hometown of Century New York, then you'd be in the best pizza on Long Island. Wow. Um, from my hometown, I've seen at least 100 rocket and shuttle launches. Wow, Nicole, that's that's wild. Um, we have, uh, if you come from my tiny town in Middle England, where they may make a Worcestershire sauce, everyone pronounces very differently. Uh, so how do you pronounce it in the, uh, in the origin of Worcestershire in Middle England? Let me know, I'm probably saying it wrong. Okay, uh, so many responses. I look forward to reading them all. Why don't we, uh, like Worcester. Oh, that makes sense. Um, it's kind of like Boston is like, I think they have a town that is, is spelled like that. Okay, well, thank you all for your responses. Um, very, very cool to hear about uh, where you're from. Let's get into conditional statements because, you know, I asked you to phrase that question, your responses to that question as a conditional statement, but let's, let's actually start talking them in earnest. So what are we going to be doing today? Well, I'm going to start with a brief description of what a conditional statement is. Uh, in case you haven't started studying for the LSAT yet, this idea of a conditional statement might be new to you. So we're just going to give a quick, brief primer on what a conditional statement is. But then I want to talk about why you should learn about conditional statements on the LSAT or why anybody learns about conditional statements on the LSAT. And more importantly, what to prioritize in your learning about conditional statements when you start studying for the LSAT or as you continue to study for the LSAT. Because I think there's um, interesting ways to approach conditional statements that are not always the most productive ways to approach conditional statements. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Then we'll start talking about actually learning about conditional statements and what I view as the most productive way. So we're gonna start with a topic that is gonna be almost everything you need to know about sufficiency and necessity, about conditional statements. Then we're gonna be applying that to principles, questions that involve principles, which is the most commonly, most common way that conditional statements are tested on the LSAT. We're gonna get to time permitting some more advanced diagramming and deductions, AKA stuff that is often overcomplicated, but we'll try to simplify here. And then at the end of that, we'll be hitting the hour mark and I'll be answering those questions that you have. So if you have any questions for that last portion, again, please write those questions out in the Q&A section of Zoom and I'll get to those. Okay, so with that said, let's start with just a prime of what are conditional statements? What are these things? Well, a conditional statement is just a fancy way of referring to an if-then statement. This is literally something we say every single day. We're speaking to another human being, we're probably using conditional statements some of the time. We don't know that they're called conditional statements. We do not realize that there's a logic to these statements as you're using them in everyday speech, but there is a logic to them. And these statements are important on the LSAT. Now, essentially what these statements say are, if something is true, then something else must be true. Or if something occurs, then something else must occur. Or if something exists, then something else must exist. That's what we call them if-then statements. Any, if something happens, then something else happens. That's it. So not too complicated, but this is a very common relationship on the LSAT, especially on logical reasoning and oftentimes on logic games as well. So it's important to understand what these relationships are. It's also important to have a system of abbreviating these relationships because over the course of doing the LSAT, you're gonna to have to write down a fair number of these conditional statements. So you can represent this with a really simple diagram. If something, arrow, then something else. That arrow is gonna represent the if-then relationship. Something, arrow, something else. That's the way we can abbreviate this when we write this out. Now we give fancy words to each side of the arrow. The left side of the arrow we call the sufficient condition. So whatever goes on that left side, we call the sufficient condition. And then whatever goes on the right side, we call the necessary condition. Uh, got a quick comment from someone. Um, it was addressed to a host of panelists. If you want to address everyone attending this, 
you have to change that two line to everyone so that everyone can see your claims. If it just says host and panelists, then it's just uh, me and my colleague Katie who are going to be able to see your comments. But this comment addressed uh, to Katie who I, and I, who I think was addressed to everyone was, if anyone else is hearing any feedback or live time, if that's the case, let us know. We'll see if there's anything we can um, do to rectify it. But at any rate, um, back to the topic at hand, it's efficient on the left, necessary on the right. And we're gonna spend a fair amount of time discussing what those two things mean. But this is just a basic primer on conditional statements. Why are we learning them? What is the point of actually learning them on the LSAT? Because I don't think this is something that is always made very clear to people. Now, almost every LSAT program teaches conditional statements very early on in the curriculum. It's often the first thing we ask people to learn when they're studying the LSAT, even though Anyone who teaches the LSAT will tell you that this statement, more than, or sorry, this topic, conditional statements, more than many, many other topics, is a stumbling block for many test takers. It's often a very difficult thing for people to understand and apply. And it feels like a lot of test takers, when they're studying for the LSAT, get this conditional statements and are just like, whoa, I don't, I mean, this is hard. This is much harder than I anticipated. So why do we start with these? If we know it's gonna be a stumbling block for many test takers, why do we ask our students to start with these? Well, almost every test prep company will, will say stuff along these lines. These are the benefits of studying conditional statements early on. It's important to practice early, so you can build good habits and speed and comfort, and it can help you kind of simplify the often difficult language on the test, make that all will help you save time on test days by allowing you to anticipate what the right answer is gonna say, confidently select it, oftentimes without having to read any of the other answer choices. So it's important that you start with this early. Okay, those are all true. These are all well and good. But the problem with that for most test takers is that if you're starting an LSAT prep program, all of these benefits, will they benefit some hypothetical future you down the line? after a lot of practice. But all of this creates difficulties and frustrations for present you. And that is a tough nut to crack. That is often a point of testing, of, of studying the LSAT. But a lot of test takers say, you know what, maybe this isn't for me. Or you know what, maybe I shouldn't even bother with this diagram. So we have this topic that we want to teach you. We we'll teach it to you early, but we know it creates a lot of difficulties. And why is that? Well, why is this topic so challenging to so many? In my opinion, the problem is often less about the students who are learning it and much more about the problem, about the programs themselves. Many people studying for the LSAT find the subject of conditional statements confusing, tedious, and more trouble than it's worth. Some even come to the conclusion that it's unnecessary on the LSAT. Why is that? Well, I think a lot of times people who teach the LSAT make this concept more difficult than it needs to be. Do tactics like require you to memorize a ton of different words rigid and flexible rules about how to diagram and apply these conditional statements. Using jargony definitions to describe what sufficiency and necessity are. Prioritizing skills with conditional statements that actually do not yield that many points on this text. And then relying on outdated and unrepresentative questions to help you learn these. These are all issues that I see with how conditional statements are taught. And these are all issues that I want to rectify today. Part of the title of this was all that you need to know about sufficiency and necessity. What I want to attempt to do today is change your mind about diagramming, show you that there's an easier way to learn it and that's going to ultimately result in more points on the test. So what I want to do is change your mind about diagramming. That is what I hope to accomplish today. Now, 
Some people look at this chart though, and they say, oh, there's all these challenges. Maybe I don't have to worry about conditional statements. So I do just want to show you why we do have to address conditional statements, even though it is difficult. It just shows up a lot on logical reasoning. I've kind of collected the data on how many questions were diagrammable on the logical reasoning sections of 10 recent practice exams. And as you can see, on every of these practice exams, we, or if we look at all these practice exams, it averages out to be about 10 questions that are diagrammable on each practice exam. So unfortunately, we came here hoping to learn that conditional statements actually aren't that important on the test. I cannot in good faith tell you that. It is a concept that is, pre that is tested prevalently on this test. Now, in full disclosure, these 10 prep tests that were listed here, these were four scored section prep tests, meaning there are about 100 questions on these prep tests. So if there's about 10 diagrammable questions per prep test, then that means about 10% of the overall questions were diagrammable. So about 10% of your score was based on your ability to diagram conditional statements. Now things are a little bit differently since these prep tests were given. Now there are three score sections on the test. The ELSA has three score sections. Now, whereas these 10 tests had four sections, two of which were logical reasoning question, logical reasoning sections. The current LSAT has three sports sections, only one of which is a logical reasoning section. So when I say on these tests, there were about 10 programmable questions on average, we can cut that in half now. On the LSAT with only one logical reasoning section now, there's about five diagrammable questions on each test. But since there's about 75 score questions in total, those five questions represent about 7% of your overall score. So it's still an important concept, just ever so slightly less prevalent than it's been tested before. At any rate, it's a topic that shows up over and over again, and it is a topic that you do need to learn. However, if you're having trouble with conditional statements, I think I have some good news for you. As you can see in these bar charts, and maybe a little bit more clearly in this pie chart, if you actually look at how conditional statements get tested on the test, they show up most frequently as these principal questions. Oops. The principal questions are the most commonly tested type of conditional statement question uh, on this exam. And yeah, I'm glad you noticed that FW. The deductions refer to questions that generally re require you to make transitive deductions. We'll get into a little bit of what that is much later on in the session. Essentially, these are questions in which you are given pieces of information and you have to make an inference or add a premise that makes an inference that was already made completely valid. That's what I refer to as the making deductions. I think the good news that we're going to learn today about diagramming is the principles are more important in terms of your final score than those making deductions. Now, an issue I have with the way that conditional statements get taught a lot on the LSAT by a lot of different test prep companies is that they put all of the emphasis on that making deductions part. People who have the most difficulty with conditional statements tend to have the most trouble with that making deductions part. And often that's the first thing you learn. So right when you're getting used to making uh, diagramming conditional statements and figuring out what they mean and how they can be applied, you're being asked to do some of those difficult stuff with those. And that creates a major stumbling block for a lot of students. What I'm here to tell you is that if we focus instead on principles, the part of diagramming that shows up the most on this exam, we can start to get more comfortable with diagramming today and see results more quickly and have those results translate to even more points on the LSAT than if we were focusing on that making deductions part without having to foreground all of that frustration. So that's what I want to talk about today. Let's learn about conditional statements and let's do it in a way that actually reflects how conditional statements show up on this test. So to be clear, 
Here's what we want to learn about conditional statements. And I'm going to do this in order of importance. Number one thing we need to know about conditional statements, because this is going to help us in every single question that involves conditional statements, is just the meaning of sufficiency and necessity. What do the words sufficient and necessary mean? You recall that when we diagram conditional statements, we put the sufficient condition on the left and the necessary condition on the right. We're going to talk about what both of those conditions actually mean. After that, we want to learn which words mean sufficient and which words mean necessary. Now, another issue I have with the way that conditional statements get taught a lot is that teaching people which words mean sufficient and which words mean necessary is just giving you a long list of words that mean sufficient and a long list of words that mean necessary and asking you to spend all of your precious time memorizing those words. But that's not fun. And that's not going to make you a master of sufficiency and necessity because no matter what list we provide you, that list is not going to be exhaustive. It's not going to include all of the words that mean sufficient and necessary. And I think it misses the point. I think it misses the point of knowing what sufficiency and necessity means gets reflected in how we recognize the words that mean sufficient and how, what words mean necessary. So I'm going to give you an alternative to recognizing the words of sufficiency and necessity today that's not going to require us to memorize a ton of words. The next most important thing we have to learn is how to make simple deductions, super simple deductions. Because these are the deductions that show up most frequently on the LSAT. It's not those super complex deductions. It's, it's relatively simple deductions that are mostly just based on the meaning of sufficiency and necessity. And then the next most important thing, because this is the topic that shows up the most on the test, is how these simple deductions based on sufficiency and necessity interact with the concept of principles and the application of principles in an argument. This is something that many programs never make entirely clear or they significantly de-emphasize. Despite this, as we discussed, being the area in which conditional statements show up most frequently on this test. Doing this is going to earn you the most points with conditional statements. So you need to learn one, two, and three in order to effectively do four. And that's going to be what we talk about today. And if that's where your abilities with conditional statements stops, that's fine. That can get you into the scores of the 160s potentially. So you're not worrying about anything that's much more complicated than this. If you just focus on learning this, that can get you enough points, provided you're learning all the other stuff in the LSAT test. That can earn you enough points to get into the 160. There are more things you can learn how to do if you're attempting to master conditional statements, earn those scores in the 170s. Next thing we how to make slightly more deductions. Time permitting, we'll touch on that today. You also want to learn how to disprove a conditional statement, have find evidence that would show that a conditional statement is actually false. How to diagram conditional statements with ands and ors in them, how to make complex deductions with those, and finally, how to diagram statements with quantifiers and make deductions with those. And by quantifiers, I mean statements that are most and some. Instead of conditional statements, which tend to be all or nothing affairs, these are statements that kind of get into the gray area of most and some. But like I said, these are all kind of break glass in case of emergency topics. They're things that you might not need to use on your test. If you do need to use them, it's probably going to only be on like one or two questions. It's not going to be on most of the questions that you have to do. Most of the diagramming questions you have to do, or at least the plurality of questions that you'll have to do that involve diagramming, will be those principle and application arguments that we're going to talk about today. So let's get into that. So let's get into what is the meaning of sufficiency and necessity. We talked about that as being the most important thing. It's so important, in fact, that I'm going to use that as an entryway point to actually go through steps one, two, and three of learning about conditional statements. The meaning of sufficiency and necessity is going to help us understand how to recognize words that mean sufficient and words that mean necessary. And it's also going to help us understand how to make simple deductions with that. So all of these go hand in hand, and I guess hand, I guess there's a third hand if there's three things. But I want to go through all these things to simplify this concept to you as much as I can. So let's get into that. The first thing I'm going to show you 
is a bunch of words that indicate a sufficient condition. Words like if, or when, whenever, in order to, in the event that, provided, and for it to be. What I'd like you all to tell me in the chat section is, what do these words sound like to you? Like what kinds of words are these? When these words show up in a sentence, what kind of sentence is that? So we'll think about this for a second. You can change the two line to everyone so we can all see your answers. Let me know what kind of, what do these words sound like to you? What kinds of words are these? They're conditional. Uh, we get a little bit more specific than I talked about, but I like that. Uh, I like you're you're not wrong, certainly. <laughs> um, the qualifier limit the conditions are they limiting? Hmm. Anticipatory. I, I kind of like that, Victoria. Prefaces, the precursors to potential events. Let me ask you this question. When you see a word like if or when or in the event that, is something happening? Is that an indication that something could or will happen? Yeah. If this happens, okay, when this happens, in the event that, Chelsea, I, I love that description. They are starter words, they are push words. What these words sound like to me is that these are words that are pushing an on button. Something's happening. If this happens, here's what's gonna happen. When this happens, here's what's gonna happen. Oh, that's a good way to think about it. Mercedes, a flow chart. Like, okay, if we have this, then we're gonna get that. Yeah, that's absolutely true. In the event that this happens, here's what we expect to happen. Totally. So they're telling us essentially that the sufficient condition is triggered and a necessary condition will follow. And that's really what conditional, that's what really what sufficient means. If this happens, then here's something that's gonna follow. So words that follow these button pressing terms are generally sufficient. So part of training ourselves to start diagramming conditional statements is starting to recognize which words are pressing that on button, which words are that starter words or push words as Chelsea so eloquently put it, which words sound like they're starting a flow chart as Mercedes put it really well. Let's give you an example. We're gonna continue the theme of stereotyping uh, based on location, like we did when we uh, were starting uh, with that icebreaker earlier on. So I'll start by uh, stereotyping my own city. If you speak to somebody who lives in Los Angeles, they will bring up their astrological sign. Now I highlighted the button pressing word there, if. That tells me that that thing that follows if, speaking to someone who lives in Los Angeles, is going to be my sufficient condition. So it's going to have to go on the left side of an arrow. And then on the right side of the arrow, the thing that will necessarily follow is bringing up their astrological sign. So we can abbreviate this as if you speak to another person, then they're going to bring up their sign. If we press that button of speaking to an LA person, then they're going to bring up that sign. But what does that mean to be sufficient? And what deductions could we be, be based on that idea of sufficiency? Let me give you all a hypothetical. You're speaking to a guy from Los Angeles. What can you conclude is gonna happen? Let me know in the chat section. What's going to necessarily happen if you're speaking to a guy from Los Angeles? Talk about their sign. Very good. We're all good. Yeah, very, very good. Victoria and Flavian and Sam and Alexandra and Mercedes and uh, Anel and Erica. Very, 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 very good. He's going to bring up his sign. And that's really the first simple deduction that we'll make. We can give you the kind of jargony definition to it, but it's not really necessary. 
basically that. It's okay. We have a conditional statement. If you speak to an LA person, then they bring up their sign. As soon as we get that sufficient condition, we know we can conclude, we can make the deduction that the necessary condition will follow. In that case, this person will bring up their sign. Of course, there's a lot of other ways to post that on button. There's a lot of different ways that the LSAT will phrase this. Another way that they could phrase it, when you speak to someone who lives in Los Angeles, they will bring up their astrological sign. Is when also pushing a button in this case? Is it pushing the button of speaking to someone who lives in Los Angeles? Is it triggering that event? That is happening? Yeah. It's working in the same way as if. So would we diagram this any differently than we diagram the last one? No, of course not. We'll diagram it the exact same way. On the left side, we'll put that sufficient button pressing thing, speaking to an LA person. On the right side, we'll put the necessary condition, bringing up their sign. Same thing. And of course, we can make that same deduction. Even though this is phrased a little bit differently, it would lead logically to the same exact deduction. Hypothetical, you're speaking to a guy from LA. Well, we can conclude that that person is going to bring up their sign. And again, we can phrase this differently. In the event that you speak to someone who lives in Los Angeles, they'll bring up their astrological sign. Is that phrase in the event that pushing that button? Is it functioning in that same button pressing way as if and what? Sure. Yeah. So we would diagram it the same way. If we speak to an LA person, then they bring up their sign. So I could have given you a list of all of the words that could potentially press a button. I think it's actually better to tell you, hey, these are how a lot of sufficient words work. They press a button. They say, this is happening. They trigger that event. They start the flow chart. And then part of learning how to do the LSAT, especially with conditional statements, is learning and training yourself to see all of the words that the LSAT might use that press that button. You'll start to see these words. Made it a little easier for you by highlighting the button pressing words in these examples. But as you get more practice and more experience, these words will stand out to you almost as much as they stand out now with the uh, different colored font. And that's part of getting better at the LSAT. Seeing these words, reading these words, reading a passage and saying, oh, I see a button pressing word. Awesome, that means I have a conditional statement and what follows that button pressing word is my sufficient condition. It's gonna go on the left side of the arrow. There is occasionally times where it gets a little tricky. Uh, not bring up their sign, not from LA. Uh, Dina, we'll get to that in just a second. I'll bring up what that refers to when we talk about necessary conditions and how to recognize those. Okay, so in this example, a person from Los Angeles would bring up their astrological sign if you speak to them. So now we put the button pressing word if and transition it. So it's now at the end of the sentence instead of at the beginning of the sentence. So would we diagram this opposite? Would we put speaking to an LA person on the right side of the arrow now? It would be the same diagram. Got a couple of votes for same diagram. Does anyone want to disagree? Not seeing any debate here. So yeah, I won't, I won't linger on this. No, we're gonna do it the same way. It's still the button pressing word. It doesn't matter what order it shows up in the sentence, if you see that button pressing starter word, like if, what follows that word if is gonna be our sufficient condition. It's gonna to have to go on the left side of the arrow. And of course, it's the same conditional statement. You can make the same conclusions. You're speaking to a guy from LA, he's gonna bring up his sign. By the way, I think now I have to bring up my sign on the Virgo. I love rules that made me like the LSAT. Take, Take, take that as you will. Um, but of course, there are other sufficient keywords. Words like all and each and every and any and people who and those who. Not necessarily button pressing words. So what do these words sound like to you? What kinds of words are these? 
Let me know in the chat section. How do you feel about these words? You see words like this in a sentence. What kind of sentence is that? Absolute. Yeah. Categorical, that's a good way. Quantifiers, yeah, but grouping, that's a great way to put at it, to put it. How many are we talking about when we say all or each or every? We're talking about the whole game. Universals are like that. Yeah. To me, these words sound like they're very inclusive. They include the whole game. They include the whole gap category. They're universal. They apply to everyone in this category. They're very broad. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever could be in this category can be whatever reads as like fun saying, but if you think of that as a very inclusive word too, you'd be absolutely correct. These kinds of words are also like that sufficient. But in my eyes, these words are super inclusive. They include the whole game. And they're telling us that all of these sufficient conditions are going to possess that necessary condition. So words that follow these inclusive sounding terms are generally sufficient. They include the whole game, they're universal, they're categorical, and that they include the entire category. These are also going to tell us what goes on the left side of that arrow. So for example, moving into a different uh, regional stereotype, everyone who moved to New York will mention that they live in New York. Has anyone, has anyone recently moved to New York here and started doing this or know someone who started doing this? I don't know, I, I, I notice this uh, all the time. They're like, yeah, I just moved to New York. It's great, it's like the best city. I, uh, I was walking down Houston Street the other day, which you probably, pronounces Houston Street, but I, I say Houston Street because I live in New York, I'm like you. Know, like, uh, it's like, okay, well, calm down, you get it, you live in New York. Anyway, um, in this case, that word everyone, is that a very inclusive, universal, categorical word? Yeah. So what's going on the left side of our arrow in this case? What's our sufficient condition? That's people who moved to New York. And what is going to be necessarily true of everyone who just moved to New York? They're going to mention that they live in New York. And of course, we can draw similar conclusions. If you're speaking to someone who just moved to New York, what can we conclude is going to happen? They're going to mention that they live there. In some way, they will tell us. They live in New York. And of course, there's a lot of different ways that this, get, can, this relationship can be conveyed. Anybody who just moved to New York will mention that they live in New York. Anybody is similarly inclusive, right? Includes the whole gang, it's universal, it's categorical. We diagram it in the same way. It tells us that moving to New York is a sufficient condition. Those who moved to New York will mention that they live in New York. That also is going to include the whole game. We're going to diagram that in the exact same way. So those are the two types of words that can introduce sufficient conditions. Well, I now want to turn our attention to, and this is going to, we're going to go circle back to the question you asked earlier, Adina. We're going to circle back, we're going to talk about necessary keywords. So now I have a list of words that mean necessary. Words that give us necessary conditions. How do you feel about these words? What do these words sound like to you? What kinds of words are these? Can someone use only your needs or must in a sentence? What kind of sentence is that? It's a limiting sentence. I, I agree. It's guaranteeing. It sounds like an obligation. I agree with that, Victoria. It's dependent, yeah. It's definitive, yeah. That's a great way of phrasing it, Anastasia. 
to me, these words sound like they're super restrictive. Like I like these words, like I can imagine like my, my parents saying these words to me when I was a kid. Like you need to eat your vegetables if you want to go play outside. Bossy language, absolutely, Roger. You have to clean your room if you want to see your friends. Only if you, um, I don't know, take out the garbage, can you play video games, that kind of thing. Like they're bossy words. And these really restrictive, demanding, commanding, bossy words, they're telling us that these conditions have to be present if we're gonna have that sufficient condition. They gotta be around, you gotta do them, they have to exist, they have to occur. So words that are these restrictive sounding terms are generally necessary. Let's give you some examples. Continue with our regional generalizations. Living in the Pacific Northwest requires people to pretend that rain does not bother them. Requires is gonna be a restrictive word there. You have to do it, you must do it. We're gonna boss you and tell you that you have to do this. So that condition, pretending that rain doesn't bother you, is gonna go on the necessary side, on the right side. So if we rephrase this into if then language, it's gonna be if you live in the Pacific Northwest, then you have to pretend that rain doesn't bother you. So let me give you a hypothetical now. You learn that someone lives in the Pacific Northwest. What can you conclude is gonna happen? Same deduction, right? You learn that someone, they're gonna pretend rain doesn't bother them. Let me ask you another question though. If you learn that someone pretends that rain doesn't bother them, can we conclude anything about that person? Why not? We can't conclude that they live in the Pacific Northwest. Good, it sounds like some of us were already learning. We can't go the opposite. There's a reason this arrow exists. We're not allowed to go in the opposite direction. When we try to say, oh, this person pretends that rain doesn't exist. Oh, therefore they must live in the Pacific Northwest. That's not gonna follow because there could be a lot of people who pretend that rain doesn't bother them, who don't live in the Pacific Northwest. Maybe they like to think of themselves as like tough, resilient people who don't, like rain's not gonna bother them. Maybe they live in other rain places and rain doesn't bother them because of that. Maybe they live in like, I don't know, it's another rain place, like a more equatorial area. Could be. So we can't go the other way. And that's, that's one of the flaws that the test challenges you to recognize over and over again. But what about this question? You learn that someone doesn't pretend that rain doesn't bother them. They're like me. I see a drop of rain and I freak out. I lose, it ruins my day. I start complaining about seasonal affective disorder. What can you conclude about that person? Very good, Victoria, Melissa, and Roger. We can conclude that they do not live in the Pacific Northwest. Because we know that they, maybe we can conclude that they're adaptable, Fabian, but we definitely can conclude they do not live in the Pacific Northwest because if they did live in the Pacific Northwest, they would have to be required that they have that quality of pretending that rain doesn't bother them. So if they don't have that, they can't live in the Pacific Northwest. Of course, there's a lot of ways to phrase this. They could also say that to live in the Pacific Northwest, people have to pretend that rain doesn't bother them. We diagram that the same way. Again, have to would be that same restrictive, demanding, bossy language. So that again would tell us to put it in the necessary condition. We could also say only people who pretend that rain does not bother them live in the Pacific Northwest. In this case, only is that bossy, restrictive, demanding word. So pretending that rain does not bother you 
is still going to go on the right side of the neuron. Now, a couple of us have referred to this concept of the contrapausal already, so we'll address it now. So we said that only people who pretend that rain does not bother them live in the Pacific Northwest. We diagrammed as if you live in the Pacific Northwest, then you have to pretend that rain doesn't bother you. We also said that once I show you a person who, like me, does not pretend that rain doesn't bother them, we can validly conclude that that person does not live in the Pacific Northwest. That's going to be the second common deduction that we have to make, and it's called the contrapositive. And that second common deduction would allow us to rewrite this condition statement in a different way. We could write it as, okay, if you don't pretend that rain doesn't bother you, then don't live in the Pacific Northwest. These two are logically equivalent claims. They imply each other. They're essentially saying the same thing, just in different ways. So when we need to, whether to answer a question or make a deduction or apply a principle, we can always rewrite a conditional statement in its contrapositive form. We just have to remember to reverse the order of the conditions so that they're on opposite sides of the arrow. Notice how we put pretend rain on the left side and the Pacific Northwest on the right side. And then we have to negate them. We have to cross them off. Or if they're already crossed off, we just remove that cross off. So to recap, again, items one, two, and three of learning about conditional statements, the most important stuff. Words that push the on button, start the flow chart, start things, those are sufficient indicators. When we recognize those words, we think it's a sufficient condition. Words that include the whole game, they're universal, they're categorical. Those are also sufficient indicators. And what sufficient means is that the presence of that sufficient condition is enough to conclude that we'll get the other condition. Oh, you show me a guy who is from Los Angeles, I will tell you that person's gonna tell me that that's a logical sign. You show me someone who just moved to New York, we know that person's gonna soon mention that they're from New York. Words that are extremely restrictive. Those are necessary indicators. Only needs, requires, must, demands, those kinds of stuff. The presence of a necessary condition is not enough to conclude that we'll get the other condition. Just because you show me that someone pretends that rain doesn't bother them, that's not enough for me to tell you that they're from the Pacific Northwest. However, the absence of that necessary condition is enough to conclude that we won't get the other condition. Show me that someone doesn't pretend that rain doesn't bother them, then we know that that person can't be from the Pacific Northwest. If we want to take the contrapositive, we reverse the order of the conditions and negate both. That's a valid way of restating a conditional statement. Are we all still together? Are we all, are we all on board with this? Type of okay, got it, ready to move on. But I want to use this as a time to pause in case you have any questions. Okay, I've got some okays. Let's see how well you, you understand this. Got a drill for you. So I'm going to go through a couple of conditional statements. And for each in the chat section, Write if the phrase in bold is a sufficient condition. So you can just write S for sufficient condition. Or if it's a necessary condition, you just write N for, for necessary condition. Now, I told you this was going to be fast paced. You don't have a lot of time to do this. So I want to kind of combine two things, like mash up two parts of this into one. I want to give you little pieces of advice about diagramming to help you diagram more effectively while also drilling you. So kind of combine those into just one exercise. You'll see what I mean after the second or third example. So again, look at the example on the board. This phrase in bold, right? If it's sufficient or necessary. So first one, anyone who reads this is practicing their diagramming skills. That's sufficient or necessary. 
Awesome. It's just seeing a, a rolling wave of S's. That's absolutely correct. Because we have that inclusive, include the whole game kind of thing. It's all of us, anyone who's reading this. That's going to be our sufficient indicator. If you're reading this and you're practicing, you need to keep practicing if you'd like to diagram more quickly. Diagram more quickly. Is that sufficient or necessary? Got a lot of sufficients. Got an N or two. So, so if you select an N, what I'd like you to do is look at this. Okay, we're trying to figure out what role this plays. Let's look backwards in the sentence until we hit a word that is either inclusive, button pressing, or restrictive. We get to this point, and then we hit this word, if. If, is that pressing a button? Is that really inclusive, or is that really restrictive? Presses the button. So it's going to be sufficient. Even though it shows up second in the sentence, remember, pressing the button, it's got to go on the left side. If you're diagramming more quickly, then you need to keep practicing. Let's try another one. You will improve your diagramming quickly. Only if you review your mistakes. Is reviewing your mistakes sufficient or necessary? Single lens. A few S's, that's okay, we're learning. Again, look at this term, look backwards until you hit a word that sounds really restrictive or sounds like it's pressing a button. This one's a little tricky because you hit that if and you're like, ha ha, pay dirt. That is inclusive. You always want to check if there's an only nearby. Only is one of the most important words we're going to encounter on the LSAT because only is so, 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 so dang restrictive. So because we hit only if here, only is restrictive. It's not saying you press the button, you're saying you have to do this. So that's gonna be necessary. If you wanna improve your diagramming, then you need to review mistakes. Reviewing mistakes effectively demands practicing self-forgiveness. Self-forgiveness. A lot of ends, very good. That's because this word demands, that's a very restrictive word. It's gonna go on the right side of the arrow. Super good, everyone. A keen eye for detail is needed to diagram for deconditional statements. Keen eye for detail, is that sufficient or necessary? Absolutely right, necessary. This time we actually have to look forward to see what we're told about that word. We're told that word is needed, that's strong, that's demanding, that's telling us that's going to have to go on the right side of the arrow. It's a necessary condition. Diagramming quickly requires using short, memorable abbreviations. This is true when you're diagramming. Don't write out the entire thing. Don't make really long, hard to remember abbreviations. Make it short, memorable. And yes, that's going to be a necessary condition. That word requires is that demanding, restrictive word. You'll understand the statement as long as you rephrase it as an if then sentence. Is that sufficient or necessary? This one's great. So glad you guys are doing it. I didn't even tell you what this word means. Did not ever once put this phrase on the board as a sufficient necessary indicator. And you know what? You all figured it out. And that just warms my, uh, my cold, dead LSAT instructor heart. I see people apply knowledge like that. As long as it's like a button pressing word. As long as this happens, if this happens, when this happens, in the event that this happens, it kind of means the same thing. And you all figured out that that is a sufficient indicator. And that's the hope, Roger. That's the hope that after a while it becomes intuitive. 
I'm asking you to memorize a lot of words. I'm asking you to understand what those words mean. And I think by doing that, we get a more intuitive sense of what's sufficient and what's necessary. It seems like for some of us, that's already happening. It's not happening for you yet, but that's okay. Keep practicing, keep looking out for these words, keep reviewing your mistakes, and you will get there. I did also promise that we're gonna apply this to principles. I do want to talk about how this information gets applied most commonly on the test. Because like I said, this sometimes gets overlooked by test takers or test prep companies. So let's talk about what a principle is. Principles are a commonly tested concept on the LSAT for one. But over, over a third of questions involved diagramming on the LSAT do involve principles. So what is a principle? Well, a principle is a general rule that can be applied to certain situations in order to reach a conclusion. Now, the reason why principles show up so often on diagrammable questions is principles on the LSAT are almost always conditional statements. So let me give you an example of how a principle will get applied. Principle. Anyone who reclines their seat on a crowded flight is acting immorally. Now just start off, is this a conditional statement, yes or no? It is. How do we diagram it? Anyone is going to be our sufficient or necessary is going to be acting immorally. If you recline your seat on a crowded flight, then you're acting immorally. We have anyone, which is that very inclusive, gang hole here, gangs all here kind of thing. I like that, uh, Annalie. Recline seat, then acting immorally. RSAI. How are you going to apply that? We're going to apply that by giving relevant pieces of evidence. Guy person just reclined to seat on a crowded flight. We can conclude that guy person acted immorally. We have that principle. We give evidence about a very generically named person. They recline their seat on a crowded flight, and we conclude that that guy was acting immorally. That is how principles get applied. It's really not that different than what we were just talking about. Now, what do you notice about the application? What do you notice about the evidence here? What is that evidence? Let me know in the chat section. Yeah, I think FW, I think I, I follow that evidence is the same as the sufficient. The evidence is the sufficient condition. Now, what do you notice about that conclusion? Matches the necessary. That's all applying a principle is. We get a conditional statement. We take the sufficient condition and we provide that as evidence. And then we draw a conclusion that is the necessary condition. It's very similar to what we were just doing earlier when we were talking about like, hey, if a guy's from Los Angeles and he mentions his sign, this guy's from Los Angeles, what can we conclude? Matches his sign, not very different than that. Now this gets, this gets put onto questions. Questions on the LSAT will sometimes give you the principle and then ask you to, ask you to pick the answer choice that is the valid application of that principle. So let's take Air Airlines, another generically named thing. Very bad at naming things uh, when I write stuff. Air Airlines new policy is that all passengers who take their shoes during a flight will be banned from all future flights. Okay. Take off your shoes during the flight and you're banned. Which of these is a correct application? A. Joe Felowich was banned from flying with Air Airlines. We can only conclude that Joe took off his shoes during the Air Airlines flight. 
or B, Gal Humanson just took off her shoes on an Air Airlines flight. Sure, it was over. Therefore, Gal will be banned from all future Air Airlines flights. Or Jane McLady woman kicked off her sneakers during Air Airlines flight. Clearly, Air Airlines policy dictates that Jane could be banned from future Air Airlines flights. A, B, or C, which is the correct application. Get some C's, get a lot of B's. This is where principles can get a little trick. This is where principles can get a little tricky. So no one picked A, though there was someone who kind of mentioned they kind of like A. What A is doing is backwards. It's saying, oh, this person was banned, therefore they must have taken off of their shoes. Remember, we're not allowed to just reverse them. That's what A is trying to do. There could be a lot of other things that would get you banned from Air Airlines. Maybe like if you complain about certain precautions that Air Airlines has so much and cause such a scene that a flight attendant of Air Airlines is forced to duct tape you to the seat that will also ban you from all future Air Airlines flights. Maybe Joe did that. Maybe it wasn't him taking off his shoes. Maybe it was something more like that. So that's why A isn't going to be correct application. It's going backwards. B, however, looks like it's going in the right direction. Sometimes what they do on these though, is they give you something that's very close to the sufficient condition, but not quite. How is the sufficient condition, or how is the evidence in B different than the sufficient condition of the principle? After the flight was over. Yeah, they say during a flight. Yeah, so sometimes you have to read very, very carefully to make sure that it's actually a correct and precise application of the sufficient condition. C, though, is perfect. She kicked off her sneakers during the fight. She could be banned. Now, some of you are like, well, this says will be banned. So why is this saying could be banned? That's not an issue. It's always okay to go weaker than what the principle dictates. That you will be banned, that implies that you could be banned too. It's always okay to be weaker. This could have said, Air Airlines policy dictates that Jane will probably be banned or will be banned. All of those would have been okay. All of those would have been okay. So when we're applying a principle, all we have to do is write out the conditional statement, make sure that it's precise, we avoid little traps like B, and find the one that gives us the sufficient condition as evidence and draws a conclusion consistent with the necessary condition. Other questions will give us the application and ask us to pick an answer choice that is the principle that would make that application valid. So let's take this as an example. An Air Airlines flight attendant recently observed a passenger request a second four ounce bag of salted pretzels. Based on this, Air Airlines banned this passenger from all future Air Airlines flights. Which of these principles would justify Air Airlines decision? If a passenger gets banned from Air Airlines flights, it must be because they requested a second bag of salted pretzels. Or B, if an Air Airlines passenger requests a bag of salted pretzels, they will be banned from all future Air Airlines flights. Or C, if an Air Airlines passenger requests anything at all from a flight attendant, that passenger will be banned from all future Air Airlines flights. Or D, if an Air Airlines flight attendant observes a passenger say anything at all during a flight, that passenger will be banned from all future flights, air airlines, or otherwise. Everyone's saying B. That's correct. If B were true, then we would be able to justify air airlines' decision. This person requested a second bag of salted pretzels. 
Therefore, the persons can be banned. This would justify this. Would C, would C justify error airline's decision? If Air Airlines passengers request anything at all, that passenger will be banned. Really? Why not? It's too, too generalized. Well, let me ask you this. In the application, do we have a passenger requesting something? Yeah. If C is true, is Air Airlines justified in banning that person who requested something? They requested something. See if it's true, we can allow Air Airlines to ban that person. This would also justify this. C would totally justify this. That's the trick to when we're going to principles, when we're finding a principle that's gonna justify an application, it can be too broad. It can be much more generalized than the specific situation we have in the application. As long as this sufficient condition is triggered by the evidence we have, and as long as this conclusion, this necessary condition, is, is consistent with the conclusion that was drawn, we're okay. It works. Answer your question, Katya. They couldn't include both B and C on this question because they're both would be correct answers. What about D then? Based on what we just learned about C, is D going to justify Air Airlines' decision? They're both equally right, Katya. Sam, I, I see what you're saying, but a second bag would implicate a second four ounce bag. <laughs> um, so again, it's okay. So I think Ryan, Ryan spotted the issue. If Air Airlines flight attendant observes a passenger, say anything at all. Does that trigger the sufficient condition of this application? As Ryan brings up, maybe not. Well, I guess only I can see Ryan's comment. He could have requested a second packet writing. That's the issue with D. So D wouldn't work in this case. Because the airline's flight attendant could observe that passenger request something in writing or by uh, sign language. Or they could have done that on some automatic thing on the you know, back seat, the little teleprompter, the little tele television thing. Could have requested it there. So D is not too broad. That's not the way we should be thinking about principles that are going to justify an application. D doesn't trigger the sufficient condition. It's a little bit different. Okay. So we're about a little past the hour mark, but hopefully I've shown you how principles and conditional statements interact on the LSAT. So Mercedes asks, uh, would you say that when the LSAT gives you the application, like in this case, is it the necessary conclusion and the principle is sufficient? You know, what we should be looking for in cases like these is basically a conditional statement that looks like this. Premise or evidence, arrow, conclusion. And then notice that B and C are essentially that. 
They give us something that would trigger the premise and the sufficient condition. And they give us the conclusion and the necessary condition being banned from all future points. So what we're looking for on these, these types of questions is a conditional statement, a principle that has the premise as a sufficient condition and the conclusion as the necessary condition. And Alexander, don't worry about whether it's specific or general. Either could be okay. The question is, when we look at these answer choices, does the sufficient condition, or sorry, is the sufficient condition actually triggered by the evidence? So we look at A, B, C, and D. B, that sufficient condition, is triggered by the evidence. We had the Air Airlines passenger request a salted a second bag of salted pretzels in our evidence, so we can make the conclusion that that person will be banned. In C, we have an Air Airlines passenger requesting something, so that sufficient condition is triggered, so we can reach the conclusion that that passenger will be banned. With D, it's not triggered because the passenger didn't say something necessarily here. We're not triggering that sufficient condition of D with the evidence provided because maybe that flight, uh, maybe that passenger requested it in some nonverbal way. So that answers your question, Alexandra. All right. So now moving ahead to quick discussion of LSAT max. So that's why we're all here, right? And here are our products. Here's what we offer. And as it pertains to conditional statements, the topics of the day, I think we address conditional statements at LSAT Max in a really effective way. Now, we have in our course that no matter which of these you purchase, whether you want to be work with LSAT Max for 60 days with the LSAT Max 60 package, or work with LSAT Max for 180 days with the LSAT Max 180 package, or work for LSAT Max for a full year with the LSAT Max 365 package. You'll all have, with each of these, you'll have access to our course where we discuss conditional statements in what I think is a very intuitive, understandable way. A way that foregrounds the meaning of sufficiency and necessity, makes us understand that, does not require us to memorize a bunch of unnecessary things. It's gonna help us see the logic behind it, learn the logic behind it, and make it as, um, I believe it was Roger said very intuitively or very uh, eloquently earlier, going to make it all more intuitive for us. But on top of that, we have weekly office hours with a ton of amazing instructors that can teach you the secrets of sufficient necessity. So if you need a different explanation than what we provide, we have office hours all the time that address this very concept, and you can learn from a wide variety of amazing instructors. We also have, with each of these packages, one free hour of private tutoring. So if you want to meet with one of these people one-on-one, -on -one, that's included for free, one hour. So you can learn about how to best approach conditional statements. So you can work with them in a one-on-one -on -one setting to learn more about conditional statements, to improve your diagramming skills, and help you with all the different conditional statements questions on this. And that is also reflected in the detailed analytics we have in our course. You can see how you improve on conditional statements by looking at the questions that involve conditional statements and seeing your improvement and getting extra practice through that. So all of that, all of these resources are available to you to best address conditional statements. And on top of that, we have the similar support for every other concept on the LSAT. So you can use that hour of tutoring or the weekly office hours to address anything else that you need to on the LSAT. So if you want to work with a tutor in a one-on-one -on -one capacity, we have uh, packages that you can buy uh, 10, 20, or 30 hours. They can also save you uh, the cost on the course if you do that. And you can address conditional statements and whatever else with a one-on-one -on -one instructor. And again, if you make that purchase for the next 24 hours, you get 15% off. Or if you decide to wait for a little bit, 
you'll have 10% uh, off for the next month. So as I answer the questions that have been posted in the Q&A section, uh, I'll put on some, put up on the board some testimonials of uh, some of our, our past uh, success stories so you can see what they had to say. Also ask, uh, answer the questions in the Q&A section. If that's it for you, if you've learned about conditional statements, want to go on your way, that's awesome. I want to thank you for joining us today, learning a little about conditional statements. I hope conditional statements are to a certain extent demystified for you. I hope you have a better understanding of how it gets most commonly tested. And I hope that you know the meaning of sufficiency and necessity and how that interacts with principles on the LSAT, because really that is most of what you have to do with conditional statements on this test. And I think be well prepared to master conditional statements with that as your foundation. So we leave you now. I want to thank you. Wish you the best of luck in your studies. But if you're sticking around for the uh, questions, I'm going to address those now. I think there's only a couple, so this shouldn't take too long. Uh, first question is, uh, I love this one. It's a very, um, it's a very abstract kind of, uh, kind of purposeful question. Why is conditional statements important on the LSAT or law? I'll answer those each independently. Why is conditional statements important on the LSAT? Because it gets tested a bunch. <laughs> because on uh, typical LSAT, it diagram conditional statements kind of for 10% of all questions. But knowing how to diagram conditional statements and knowing the meaning of uh, sufficiency necessity would not only help on those 10% of questions, but we also help on diagramming certain rules or understanding certain statements on, on logic games and reading comprehension passages respectively. So that's why it's important on the LSAT. It yields a lot of points because it gets tested a lot. More broadly though, why are conditional statements important in the law? Well, the reason conditional statements are important in the law is that a lot of statutes, a lot of laws are actually written as conditional statements. To be liable for murder, culpable for murder, found guilty of murder, you have to do these four things. If you have this, this, and this, then you have a valid contract. If you have this, this, and this, and unless you have that, then you have an agreement between two parties. So that's why it gets tested a lot on the LSAT, is because a lot of laws and also a lot of rules that have been written by judges become part of uh, the precedent that forms the law are conditional statements. So they think if you want to think like a lawyer effectively, you need to understand how conditional statements function. So that's why they get tested on the all side. That's how they appear in the law. Uh, Adina says the November all side has three or four sections. Someone told me there are four sections now. They are four sections now, but only three of those sections are scored. The fourth section is going to be um, what's known as the experimental section. It's a section that's going to look like a second logical reasoning section or a second reading comprehension section or a second logic game section, but it's just not going to count to your score. It's a way for the test writers to test out questions that might get used on future exams. So essentially, you get to be now a human guinea pig taking a section that doesn't count, really for the benefit of the test writers and future test takers. So to answer your question, there are four sections but only three of those are going to count to your final score. Uh, another question asks, will attendees receive the recorded video? Uh, that video is going to be uh, posted to our YouTube channel. It's also going to be an email that's sent out to LSAT Max students and people um, who are on our kind of email notification list uh, with the recording. So that recording should go up in a few days. You can either look at our YouTube for the update, or I believe there's going to be an email that gets sent out about it. Uh, signing up for the tutor, um, including the program, uh, you can do that through the app itself. Or if you want to reach out to one of our customer service uh, representatives, there's a little chat bubble in the app or on the uh, desktop version of it that you can reach out to. They'll be able to get you uh, get you situated with that. All right. I believe that is all the questions for today. So thank you all for your questions. Thank you all for attending. Want to wish you the best of luck in your studies and hopefully we'll see you at some future office hours or webinars or in some tutoring sessions. Uh, best of luck, everyone. Thank you for your time.